What's up, peers, and welcome to the World Crypto Network, uh, where we now continue our reading of the Bitcoin Dev mailing list. Uh, definitely one of the core places where you can get all the most awesome Bitcoin knowledge as the brightest minds on Bitcoin are working on it. Uh, and today, uh, we're not going to read a new proposal, but rather a summary of, of a lot of discussion of the mailing list. Uh, we're going to read safer SIG hashes and more granular SIG hash no input. Uh, this particular mail is going to be by Peter Woolley, and he published it on November 28th of 2018. However, as I said, this is not a new proposal, but rather a summary of pre-existing work. Uh, and that is uh, first here, that email, which Peter himself published uh, nine days before this email, which we are going to read, where he encouraged everyone uh, to, reach, uh, to reach out and contribute here on de defining and refining a, a proposal for Sikash no input. And that sparked a, a huge conversation here with several, several people people uh, joining. We have Peter Woolley, Anthony Towns, Christian Decker, Jonas Liu, uh, Russell O'Connor, um, who else? Yeah, many, many different. Uh, Bob McEller, uh, Jonas Liu, uh, yeah. and that is just a discussion on November. It continued uh, later than in December, uh, but I think that this particular one here uh, from November 28th is a good summary. Um, so, Let's, let's get into it and let's explore what Sikash no input is uh, and, and how it is being used. Because, right, it's, it says sig, signature hash. Uh, and that is basically how you prove that you control the private key uh, of a transaction. And so you hash parts of the transaction or the entire transaction and then you sign that hash. Okay, uh, and there are many different ways that you can do that. You can either, as I said, hash the entire transaction or hash part of it. Uh, and per particular here, the sick hash no input would be that you hash everything but the inputs. Uh, and this is very, very useful, especially uh, for the Lightning Network and the L2 proposal, uh, which makes the Lightning Network or at least the updating mechanism of it, very much more efficient and much more usable. And however, we need to get here Sikash no input into the, yeah, into the protocol with a soft fork. Uh, so this is going to be a consensus critical update. And thus, it's really important uh, that we first refine these ideas and then educate others. Uh, and here, this summary by Peter Woolley does a great job. Uh, thus, the reading of it. Okay, uh, so here, as I said, on November 19th, the very first email uh, the, in, this little, uh, yeah, in this little text right here, uh, let's, let's start there. Hello, everyone. Uh, for future SegWit versions, I think it would be a good idea to add a few things to the SIG hash by default uh, that we overlooked in BIP 143. And that would be committing to the absolute transaction fee Okay, so explicitly, how many, uh, how much transaction, uh, how many, how many satoshis go to the miner itself, in addition to just the amount being spent in each input. Okay, uh, and this is really useful, especially for hardware wallets uh, that then explicitly sign the transaction fee that goes to the miner. And if you do that explicitly, it's let's say much more secure, and you you can protect against some malicious actors. And this would cryptographically remove the concerns about wallets lying about the fees to the hardware wallet device of air-gapped signers, right? So if we have partially signed Bitcoin transaction, uh, for example, in your cold card wallet, which is air-gapped and which cannot communicate uh, with the software wallet other than with the one-time SD card information transfer, then it's really important to know exactly how many fees you are, uh, you're, you're spending. Uh, further, committing to the script pub key in addition to the script code uh, would prevent lying to devices about the type of output being spent, even when the script code is correct. Okay, so, so some more edge cases here that uh, for these air-gapped cold card devices, uh, it would be really good to know exactly what the script pub key is that spends uh, or that is being spent. As a reminder, the script code is the actual executed script uh, 
which is the redeem script in non sequit pay to script hash and the witness script in pay to witness script hash or pay to witness public key hash. Okay, uh, so the script code here uh, is, uh, for example, like the, uh, like the public key to, uh, check signature and then the signature and so on, right? all the explicit Bitcoin script uh, that is now being committed to as well. As this implies additional information that may not be desirable to commit in all circumstances, it makes sense to make these optional. Okay? Uh, if you don't really need them, especially if you can communicate with the wallet. So if the signer can communicate with the wallet, which is the case, uh, for example, if you have a software wallet and the private keys are stored on the laptop itself, and then you can communicate. Then it's not really too much of an issue. This obviously interacts with the sick hash no input, which really adds two different ways of rebinding signatures to inputs. And so sick hash no input, this means that uh, you can sign something later uh, to, or, or to the inputs itself. And that will be changing uh, the previous output uh, so that the transaction ID does not need to know when the signature is created. Uh, which is really useful. Um, the transaction ID does, does not change if you sign it later. Uh, and that is, again, really useful for the Lightning Network. Uh, and changing the script itself uh, so that the exact script pubkey or redeem script does not need to be known when the signature is created. Okay, um, so we could change the script after the fact, uh, which might be useful in some cases. Of course, the second implies the first, but do all use cases require both being able to change the previous output right? uh, so that we can uh, change the signature uh, afterwards? Where was I? Hmm. <laughs> Okay, while well, BIP 118, which is partially some Bitcoin transaction, correctly points out this is secure if the same keys are only used in scripts which, with which binding is to be permitted. It feels it would be preferable if signatures and scripts would explicitly state what can change. Right? It's always nice to, to let's say, uh, prove or, or to authorize uh, with your signature that it can be changed afterwards. Uh, that really helps a lot because then, as you should always verify something before you sign it, you explicitly approve of that. And it, I, it just feels that it would take away some possible attack factors. One way to accomplish this is by indicating exactly what is in the script is subject to change, right? So you, you specifically tell, okay, I, I agree that I can, for example, change the inputs uh, which, I, uh, which spent uh, to these new outputs, for example. Here is a combined proposal. Three new SIG hash flags are added. Uh, and again, sick hash flags means you hash part of the transaction, then you sign it. So sick hash, no input, would be you specifically leave out the input. Sick hash, no fee, would be you specifically leave out the fee. And sick hash, script mask, which would be you specifically leave out the, um, yeah, you specifically leave out the, uh, the script itself, right? The script pubkey. A new opcode. Op mask is added, which acts as a n op during the execution. Um, and this here would be right that it uh, that it um, I'm not quite sure exactly here. I think it's it's that it stops the script from being from being computed, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, well, duck duck go it. <laughs> the sick hash is computed like bip one forty three, but if the sick hash script mask is present. For every op mask in script code, the subsequent op code push is removed. Ah, okay, yeah. So I, th I think I was right that when th when there is op mask on the script stack, uh, then it uh, removes all the follow the subsequent uh, code, all the following stuff. Uh, the script pub key. Uh, so this is the second point here. Uh, the sick hash is committed like pip 143, but the script pub key being spent is added to the sick hash unless script 
uh, Sikash script mask is set. Okay, so you need to explicitly uh, set Sikash script mask. The transaction fee is added to the Sikash unless Sikash no fee is set. So again, we want to explicitly state if we want to commit to the fee or not. The hash previous outputs, hash sequence, and out point are set to null when sick hash no input is set. Okay, this is like bib 118, but not for the script code. Uh, so this again is explicitly uh, stating what is being signed here. So my question is whether anyone can see uh, ways in which this introduces redundant flexibility or misses obvious use cases. And this is what started this really long conversation. Uh, and now we're going to read a, um, yeah, the somewhat a summary of what was said then so far. Okay, and again, this was published a couple of days later, uh, quoting from the email which we've just read. Uh, thanks for all the input so far. And again, this is always a fluid and continuous discussion. Uh, so be sure to be subscribed to the Bitcoin Dev mailing list or go to the archives uh, and check every now and then again uh, what awesome new stuff is being talked about. Going over the suggestions and other ideas. Okay, op mask should be required to be followed by a push. Okay, so you push something on the computational stack. Uh, and again, if you don't know uh, how the Bitcoin scripting language works, as it is a stack-based system, uh, I'm pretty sure there, there should be many videos about it in the WCN archives. Uh, if not, uh, duck, duck, go it. <laughs> as suggested by Anthony Towns. The alternative would be, uh, would permit uh, substituting arbitrary opcodes for masked pushes, which is at least very hard to reason about. This would effectively turn it into a multi-byte op make uh, op masked push opcode. Um, so basically, it, it would be kind of a requirement um, to always have op mask and then push uh, back to back, uh, so that it makes sure that everything is computed correctly. And effectively, this would um, this would kind of turn into a combined opcode. Right? If you would always have to be like op mask, op push, you might as well make a new op code, which is op masked push. Especially if this is a, um, if, it, if it can save some additional feeds. Uh, so this is again, uh, the, the core aspects here of, of how the scripting language works. And we want it to be as efficient, but yet as secure as possible. It's probably better to sign the amounts of all inputs as suggested by Jonas Lau. Uh, right, we we really want to make sure that we've committed to all of these inputs and that the signer knows what's up about these inputs, uh, because right, if you uh, if you have too many inputs and you don't specify quote unquote enough outputs, the rest, the leftover, goes to the miner. Uh, so this might be the case, right, that you um, that you all of a sudden miss one of these input amounts and then you unwillingly send it to the miner. And if you have to specify and sign explicitly the amounts of all the inputs, uh, that cannot really happen. As that would cause default SIG hashes to sign all the inputs and output amounts. Okay, right, so, so you verify and you authorize everything. Is there still the, a need to sign the transaction fee explicitly? Right? That's exactly what I just said. Uh, if you have authorized both the amounts of the inputs and outputs, then it's, it's simple like minus, like outputs minus inputs equals mining fee. And that is uh, that might not be needed then to have or to sign explicitly the transaction fee as it can easily be calculated. And you've authorized the, expli or then explicitly, or no, implicitly, uh, the mining fee. Or in other words, are there situations where changing the set of inputs or outputs after signing is desired, but the net difference between them cannot change? If not, that would remove the need for no fee. Right? So basically, right, if we, if we explicitly sign inputs and outputs all the time, then we don't explicitly need to sign no fee itself. 
do we need to keep the rule that sequence values of other inputs are only signed with default SIG hashes? So the sequence values of these inputs is which, which comes first chronologically uh, in the transaction. Uh, it starts with zero. And so the, the first input that is being specified is input zero or has the sequence number zero. Uh, and this, I don't think there's, there's much of a difference uh, between, or uh, at least both are being spent, right? Uh, so that doesn't really do anything. But uh, um, as I believe there might be some privacy concerns um, if, you, uh, if you just change these arbitrarily. Uh, so it might be nice to commit to them as well. It feels cleaner to always assign the sequence value of all the inputs that are included in the SIG hash anyway. Uh, so all of them, unless anyone can pay or no input, which would make it uh, sign only the current input sequence value. Uh, so, right, that's, that's again, um, if we have uh, no input, then we don't specify exactly uh, which UTXOs are funding this transaction. And because we don't know that, we cannot really say which comes first, right? Uh, so then this would not really be needed here. If no input also blanks the sequence value as currently specified in BIP 118, and all input amounts are signed, that would make amounts and sequence values always be treated identically. And again, because uh, the amount is directly tied to the sequence value, right? Uh, because every UTXO has a unique amount, or most of them, and thus they, you can always then commit to both of them at the same time. If mask implies no input, and no input implies anyone can pay, the three of them can be encoded in just two bits using partial script, a known script, known TX, and all inputs encoding, as Anthony Town suggests. Um, so that, and that's, again, that's a really cool thing here. With no input, uh, it implies that anyone can pay, right? Anyone can provide a funding uh, to this transaction. And thus, we can, again, save just a couple bits, <laughs> like two, two zeros and, or two ones. I mean, this, this is how efficiency-focused here uh, the Bitcoin devs are. Uh, because, well, two bits is two bits. And if uh, we have a bunch of these transactions, two bits uh, sum up to quite, quite a couple bytes. <laughs> Regarding the discussion about preventing signatures from being rebound uh, to a different script path or checksick. Um, with mass, that is Merkleized abstract uh, syntax trees, there is indeed less need for this, but at least a single tree mass construction cannot replace all the script branches. Um, so again, right, we've talked about mask and how it can be used uh, in taproot and graft root. So go a couple of videos back. A script with 40 if then else con uh, constructions may have two to the power of 40 different execution paths for which computing a Merkle T is intraceable. Uh, so this means again, right, uh, we can have quite complex uh, taproot or, or mast uh, structures and thus it's, yeah, it might be nice to commit to these as well. Just signing the opcode position of the check sick operator is not enough for all the cases either. For example, you could have a complex nested set of branches that puts a number of public keys on the stack. And when a check multi-sig after the last and if to verify all of them. And again, that's, that's the, the nuances of how the Bitcoin scripting language works. You can have several things on the stack uh, and then pop up or, or pop off a couple things on top, and then at the end have a check multisig, uh, which then hopefully validates the true. And if we have this, uh, this might uh, again leave several of these public keys on the stack. Mm -hmm. I believe that signing the opcode position plus the true or false condition of all previous if statements is probably sufficient to achieve that but it would be introduce unnecessary complexity for signers in the most cases. 
So again, it would be nicer to commit with the signature uh, to the true validation uh, of this uh, of the if clauses beforehand, because then we uh, can. Well, yeah, but not sure exactly how this would help here. Maybe it would be it would add some extra redundancy. But after all, the verification would be part uh, would would be taking place uh, all the time regardless. Thinking about signing code, adding these sorts of execution trace commitments uh, to the SIG hash means they need to know which check SIG operator, etc., they are signing for. Right? So if we end up uh, really committing to the code of the script itself, uh, then this means ex exactly that we need to specify which we are actually committing to especially when there uh, might be a uh, sick hash no input, right? Where we have new public keys being introduced to spend that. I believe that in practice, for example, hardware wallet devices will just whatever, will just whatever position the wallet indicated, rather than verifying it corresponds with a particular intended code path. Uh, so again, right, that's, that's again the more of a, yeah, let's say design decision. What exactly does the hardware wallet or the signer know and do? Um, does it have a, enough computing power and information uh, to know all the script uh, that it actually is spending here? Or is it somewhat quote unquote trusting the software wallet part, right? Uh, where it constructs the transaction and the script itself. And especially, right, how again can we prevent ban in the middle attacks with this here? Okay, I believe that in practice, for, oh, no, no, we've just read this. Okay, preventing the rebinding is not very useful. If an attacker can make you bind to the wrong thing regardless. So I'm not convinced this is even worth having by default. Again, right? If we have a malicious actor and he can com or he can send uh, things in a way that it, that, it, that it is binding right that he does commit to, uh, but then if we sign it regardless, although it is a malicious actor, it doesn't really help us too much right An alternative I'm not sure who suggested it is to simply make every check sig sign the opcode position of the last executed code separator and remove the earlier cut off script code affected by code separator. This gives a simple but somewhat limited way for scripts that need to prevent certain kinds of cross execution trace rebinding. Not sure what exactly cross execution trace rebinding is. Uh, but again, this way we can somewhat uh, commit to the code itself um, for that uh, would have happened since the last code separator. A few miscellaneous ideas uh, taken from here, uh, bipsichash2. Uh, okay, nice. This, this here is the Bitcoin or a proposed Bitcoin improvement proposal for the Sikhash. Uh, we're, we're not going to look into the code today. For a default, sign everything Sikhash by Sikhash bytes can be dropped. Uh, so if we have, if we sign or if we have Sikhash everythings, then we don't really need uh, to specify exactly which we have uh, Sikhashed. Uh, thus, again, we can save a couple of bytes. For the commitments of a script pub key and the script code, the intermediary hash should be used so that the data includes in the SIG hashes includes a hash of those rather than the script directly. Um, again, the, the question is if we should at all commit to the script code or script pub key. Uh, and if we do, how exactly and are, we, are, we, are we doing this? And this, if we do this, then this prevents to blow up in hashing time for large scripts with many different SIG hashes types in the signature. Uh, so if we have several signatures of several different private keys uh, in a script itself, and we need to hash all of these in different ways, then again, this, intro this introduces a lot of uh, resources that are needed in order to perform this. And especially because hardware wallets usually don't have too much computing power by design, right? They're supposed to be stupid. Uh, then this might be too much. 
so again, uh, trade-offs and uh, implementation decisions. When masking the script code to push opcodes immediately, following op make push or op masked push, it can be replaced by op bear if, uh, which will never collide with any real script as op bear if makes a script invalid even when occurring in an unexecuted branch. So this op bear if is a way of always invalidating your script and op make push or masked push uh, somewhat replaces that, right? Because if you, uh, if you push everything from the stack, well, then you're done, right? And most likely you're going to uh, falsify the script. SIG hashes uh, and really all new hashes that are introduced should be prefixed with a fixed 64 byte array as a tag. Right? And that way, when we have somewhat like versioning numbers or something, um, it's easier to know exactly which SIG hash method is being used. Chosen to not collide with any existing use of a SHA-256 in Bitcoin to prevent signatures from being reinterpretable as something else. And of course, because we use hashing quite a lot in Bitcoin, uh, for example, right, proof, of, proof of work is just one minor example here. Uh, that use a SHA-256. Uh, so we need to make sure that it is clear what exactly is being hashed, uh, because once it is hashed, right, it looks like, uh, like random stuff. Uh, so it, it's always nice to know exactly uh, what is going on. And you, we can do that with a prefix here uh, of 64 bytes as a tag. Picking 64 bytes as a tag size means it can be effective, efficiently implemented as just a modifier of SHA-256-4. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, size is always a uh, size matters, <laughs> and especially here uh, for all the stuff that comes on the blockchain. Uh, so a combined proposal, and this is what might be put into uh, this soft fork. Uh, so pay attention now, uh, although this is of course uh, quite complex to understand. All existing stick hash flags uh, plus the no input and the mask. Uh, which, which would mean anyone can pay or no input or mask are encoded in two bits. A new opcode called op masked push, which only, uh, whose only runtime behavior is failing if not immediately followed by a push or then appearing as the last opcode in the script. Uh, so op masked push can be kind of like the, the automatic fail of a script if it is just put in alone. But if we immediately uh, p follow it up with a push, then the script continues, okay? Signatures are 64 plus an optional SIG hash byte. And uh, uh, so now we need to have some additional data to specify uh, the SIG hashes. And of course, they need to be rather small in order uh, to save on block space because these signatures, well, they will be included in the witness part of the script. A missing SIG hash byte implies that all and all cannot be specified explicitly. Okay, so if we do not uh, choose a specific uh, SIG hash byte uh, as the prefix of the signature, uh, then this means that it is a SIG hash all where everything is hashed and signed. The SIG hash is computed from the following. That is a 64 byte constant tag. And then the data about the spending transaction, right? Uh, so again, the tag here is which, uh, what uh, specifies exactly, um, or sorry, is the signature part itself. And then the data uh, continues here with the transaction version number, the hash of the transaction input, uh, the previous outs, the amounts, and the sequences, uh, or right. So th basically, the, the the input part, uh, which would which would mean what exactly is being spent in this transaction. Of course, we don't need this if we have anyone can pay or uh, so no input for that matter. Then the hash of all transaction outputs, or just the corresponding transaction output, if it's single, uh, note it, nothing if it's none. So if we are sending the Satoshis to somewhere, right, if we are generating an output, uh, these, of course, need to be uh, included in the hash as well. 
the transaction lock time, if it has any, right, uh, or if it can be spent directly, that would be zero. The data about the output being spent, so that would be, of course, right, the, the input of the transaction uh, that spends the UTXO. So the previous output, uh, which would be here the, the transaction or the output ID, of course, if we, have, if we don't have that, uh, then it would be uh, no input. The amount uh, of the inputs, the sequence number of which specific UTXO we are spending, and the hash of the script pubkey. Uh, of course, nothing if we mask this, but uh, always then good also to commit to the script pub key that is being spent. The data about the script being executed. Uh, of course, we need to compute the, uh, the script that is being executed, and that would be the hash of the script code uh, after masking it out if mask is set. Uh, so the script code here uh, would be exactly the conditions what can spend uh, these precious Satoshi. And then the opcode number uh, from the last executed opcode separator. Uh, so this then would uh, specifically uh, dedicate or uh, commit to when exactly we're done with the script, with the code. And then the last thing added here would be the SIGHASH mode. Uh, so quite a couple changes um, were or quite a couple of things that need to be specified here uh, in the exact uh, SIG hash itself. Again, uh, complex stuff, I know. <laughs> I don't understand half of this. That's what I know also. <laughs> and this is really, really complex. But I think it's good to know. Um, and at least to, to accumulate this knowledge and having, having it heard once or twice. And of course, you're not going to understand all of this, uh, obviously. Uh, if you do, uh, then good. And uh, thank you for contributing, uh, because then you're definitely an expert. Uh, but even for, for us noobs here, uh, it's good to know somewhat what is going on here. And I think if you only took away that uh, it is important that we commit uh, to what we actually, or that we commit to something, when we sign it. And with SIGHASH and the different flags that follow, we can commit to different things. And because we can commit to different things, then we can build on top of that. For example, with SIGHASH no input, we don't commit to who actually funds this payment. Uh, and thus we can build some awesome stuff with that. For example, L2 in the Lightning Network. And I think this is also really, really important because uh, this entire Zcash upgrade might or will be done in a soft fork. And because a soft fork is a consensus critical upgrade, of course, uh, we need to make sure that all of us who are running a full node actually know what the hell we're doing, right? Or, or at least have somewhat of a, of a minimum clue. And so I know that the Bitcoin Dev mailing list is dense as hell. And I'm, again, like I myself have not understood that. And I think you notice it <laughs> every now and then again. Uh, but we really need to make sure that we at least try to accumulate this knowledge and make sure that we somewhat uh, know what code we are running. Because again, it's, this is financial self-sovereignty, right? We need to be educated in order that we are prepared uh, for the responsible actions that we take. Uh, so, Pierce, thank you very much here for, uh, for joining me in the reading of this great summary, uh, very dense, by Peter Woolley, uh, one of the chief magicians of the Bitcoin Core team. <laughs> uh, and, of course, also thanks to all the different uh, peers here who, who've given their input. Ha <laughs> ha, pun intended. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, thank you very much uh, to all of those. And, yeah, now we have somewhat of a clue what should be put into this next soft fork. And now it's just a question of how can we do it? And uh, can we implement the code? And can we push it out in a mannerly order? Uh, so, Piers, thank you very much, as always, for joining me here on the World Crypto Network. And see you on the next show. Bye-bye.